Let's go to the Lord. Take a moment. Confess sin if you need to. Let's ask the Lord to bless us. Father, we're grateful for your mercy and grace and love you've extended through Jesus Christ. I thank you that he paid for all of our sins. When he had finished, he said, it's, it's done. I've done it. I've completed the mission on the cross. And then he went to the next mission. He died physically and went and preached and visited in the heart of the earth. And then three days later, he came back in a resurrection body to secure salvation for us. Thank you for making it simple that by believing that Jesus Christ paid for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead, we're given eternal life. Pray today that you give us insight and understanding into our own nature and character and give us the ability to make changes to become more like him. And we ask it in his name. Amen. All right. There's my drawing pad. All right. I've been in discussion of deception. I got into it out of Genesis 27. <clears throat> Rebecca was interested. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was introduced to us in chapter 24 as this beautiful, wonderful woman, just right for him. And then in chapter 27, we find that she's managing him and managing the situation with her supposedly children who are at, actually at close to 70 years old when all this is going on, when she's lying and maneuvering. But she feels like she has to deceive to get the right things to happen. We saw in the first deception, the cosmic system, cosmos diabolicus, which is the devil's system of deception. It appeals to mankind's self-centered nature. The focus is people and earthly treasure as the source of our needs. We look to people in, our, in the earthly. And listen, this is the foundation of the way you think. And this causes us to enter into self-deception. Our beliefs and expectations and the way that we love others, we believe the devil's lies and we train them into habits and patterns of behavior. So the last two lessons are on video. You can watch those. Those are the last two. Then now I want to talk about how the devil's lies become our own lives that we present the way we present ourselves to others becomes false, becomes a mask. So, I mean, it's any chapter, Ephesians 4, and we're going to look at a passage. So if you're with me in chapter 4, the first six verses have to do with unity. He says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, and I beseech you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He's talking about with humility and gentleness, patience, forbearance toward one another in love. Then he goes being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, one hope, one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. All right, so there's a unity. We should be living this unity. In chapter, and in verse 7 through 16, he talks about spiritual gifts. And he goes, he talks about Christ descending. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And he talks about Christ descending and then ascending. And we know when he, got, when he sat down at the right hand, that the Father sent the Holy Spirit and out of the Holy Spirit's indwelling and filling ministry comes spiritual gifts. If you'll, if you'll look at uh, verse 11, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers. Why? For the training and equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man. This is about bringing believers into maturity. To the measure and the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Do you believe that's possible? To attain these things? 
It's just this, is this just some lofty goal to shoot at that is this or is this real? That's, that's a big question. I would contend that most people don't think that's real. And most people don't live like it's real. They just think, whoa, hey, I'm supposed to become like Christ. I'm doing my best. Well, he says, as a result of becoming a mature believer, we're no longer tossed around by different doctrines or spiritual perspectives that, were, that, were, that was plaguing the church. We'll see that in verse 17 and 19. He says, so you're no longer tossed about, but in verse 15, here's beautiful, speaking the truth in love. Our topic is deception. Speaking the truth in love, we grow up in all aspects into Him, Christ, who's the head, from Christ, the whole body, fitted and held together by the spiritual gifts, the joints and the supply and the nurturing from the head all the way through the body comes through spiritual gifts to each individual believer. We nurture one another. It's a beautiful image. The Bible's full of metaphors, images. The one we're about to see is, is a clothing metaphor. And so he goes on, and in verse 16, it's the building up the body in love. So now, if you look at your page, verse 17 through 19, he's going he's gonna to turn and talk about some things that are going on, that were going on in all the churches, actually. But he's going to say, these are, he's talking to believers now. These are not unbelievers. I say and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk like the Gentiles or the unbelievers walk. So you're a Christian. You're in the body of Christ. Hopefully you've got this spiritual nurturance available to you through the spiritual gifts that is coming down and rolling down into your life so that you have power Wisdom to no longer walk like the Gentiles or like the unbelievers. Agree? These believers know better. We're going to see in verse 20, they've been taught better. But they're still living the way they started out before they were saved. They're still living the same way. Nothing's really changed. They know more. They understand more. But their heart and their heart of hearts, they're no different. All right, so he says that no longer walk like the unbelievers. And this is a tremendous study in itself, being darkened in their understanding because they are excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance in, that's in them because of the hardness of heart. Now, what he just did is he explained everything in reverse. Hardness of heart. Oh, let me see. Hardness of heart produces ignorance because if you're not willing to listen and absorb what you're hearing, you're hardened. You can't learn. You can't grow. And so hardness of heart produces ignorance. And, and, and when you're hardened, hardened and ignorant, you're excluded from, you're separated yourself from God and you become darkened in your thinking. Your thinking becomes evil. All right? And then he says, and these people have become numb. These, are, these guys are living a lascivious lifestyle because that was, their, that was their life is in pagan religion before they got saved. They're still living this way. So he says, and they having become callous have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of immorality, impurity with greediness. Okay? Not a pretty picture. And verse 20 is the, is the verse that just knocks my socks off. He says, but you did not learn Christ in this way. Verse 17 through 19. So the, the, I had to ask myself, who actually did learn Christ in that way? Who was teaching that you could become a Christian 
and still be okay to live the same lifestyle that you had before. Who was teaching that? Somebody was. You didn't learn it this way. So, he says, you didn't learn Christ this way because, first class condition, since, indeed you have actually listened and been taught that the truth is in Jesus. Notice he's talking Jesus, not Christ. He's talking, he's talking the humanity of Jesus. He's referring to our spiritual walk. Okay? Now, he's going to get us into verse 22. He says, you've heard him and you've been taught by him. And he's going to say, here's what you've been taught. Verse 22 through 25. Verse 22 through 24 is going to give us three infinitives. And the infinitives are purpose or result. Here's the purpose or result of what you've been taught. This is what you're supposed to do. Okay? So, if you'll look at verse 22, in reference to your former manner of life, back to verse 17 through 19, uh, that you take off layers of the old man. This is a apotithemy, is a clothing analogy. And this old self is cor being corrupted by deceitful desire, it says, literally dominated by schemes that appeal to desires, the way I see it. Now this word, op this word take off, apotithemy is used for taking off clothing. It's the literal use of it. Here it's a metaphor to taking off ideas, removing ideas from your mind, from your thinking. In Acts 7.58, it's the word used when they were stoning Stephen and they took off, they peeled off their coats and put them at Saul's feet. That's the word. It means to Romans 13.12 says, take off the deeds of darkness. Colossians 3.8, take off mental sins. Hebrews 12.1, take off every encumbrance and besetting sin. James 1.21, take off every immoral and wicked practice. 1 Peter 2, take off these mental sins and be hungry for the milk of the Word. Take off, and then there's a spiritual part. So, this word does not mean to ignore to pass over, to pretend it's not there. This word does not mean that. This word means to take off, to remove. It means to remove. There's no question about it. And it's found all through the New Testament. So, it doesn't mean to ignore, to overlook, to discount, to pass over, or to leave something in place like you found it. You can't remove the sin nature but you can remove the false logic that we develop under the influence of the sin nature and the cosmic system. We build soft false logic. And that false logic becomes habit that we just cycle over and over again. It's what, it's what causes our relationships to go through these cycles. We develop these ideas. We deceive ourselves. We put these ideas into practice and they become a habit in the way that we relate. And we do the same thing over and over again. We just cycle and cycle and cycle until we re-break the pattern and stop using the logic. If your logic says it's reasonable for me to expect this person in my life to always think of me first, how realistic is that? Not very, is it? But if your logic says, well, they should think of me first, well, you just should it on yourself, but, oh, uh, sorry. Your, your logic and expectations are not real. They're imaginary. That's why you keep getting hurt and disappointed and that logic needs to be removed. How about expecting what's reasonable? 
They'll think about me some of the time, hopefully. Anyway, false logic. And he calls it the old self. The old self is a human system of beliefs, hopes, and expectations that we build out of the cosmic system. It's a system of human logic with human goals to meet our needs. Now, because we're separated from God initially in our life, we attach all that to people. See, here's the world, or we should call it the cosmos. How about that? The cosmic, the cosmos. This is the devil's lies. And we attach ourselves to these lies and we absorb these lies and we build our beliefs, these are beliefs, into our heart. See, here's your heart by believing those things. And all these different lies that you believe become your way of thinking. Well, and so we, we operate out of these false ideas toward other people. See, we... We build our relational system toward loving people or being loved by people out of the world. How's that? How well is that going to work for us? Doesn't work. Can't work. So we have these needs. First, in life, we attach them to we attach them to people and things, all of our earthly treasures. Once you're saved, you can come over and begin to attach, hopefully you begin to attach to the Word of God and you begin to build a whole new belief system. Right? Now what happens between the two of them? What does it create? Conflict. In the middle is volition. Which way are you going to go? What's not, what's not really understood is that this one over here that you built from day one in your life and you habituate, this one has an advantage over you. Now over here, you've got God the Holy Spirit. You've got the Word of God. You've got the power system that built the universe. you got a nuclear fusion inside of you. Power, power, power. But this is your habit. The moment you let go of the Spirit, boom, you're right back over there. And, you're, and you, got right, you fall right back into your old ruts. Boom, right back into your old ruts. So Paul says, what do you do with that? Some say, people I love and respect say, I just look to the Spirit. Okay, hey, that's nothing wrong with looking to the Spirit. Well, what about this logic that keeps popping up every time? Every little while, this thing cycles back up, and here you are, tempted to do this same thing. So this is repetitive sin. Why do you keep committing the same, have the same problems over and over and over and over again? Well, you've still held on to the logic so you don't sin just because this blob we call the sin nature just forced you to sin. There's a logic to your sin. There's a payoff. There's a reason why you sin and you think there's something that you're going to get from it. I'm in Esau right now and Esau thought Jacob betrayed him and he did. But it was really the, word, the will of God being put into Esau's life. If Esau could see it from God's perspective, you'd go, oh, okay. I get it. Now, Rebecca, <laughs> Rebecca schemed and everything, and Jacob did too, and they got the blessing, and Esau didn't, and he's mad. He's mad because he's thinking that was mine. That blessing was mine, and they stole it from me. No, Esau. That blessing was God's. And He gave it to who He wanted to. You don't get to decide what betrayal is. You don't get to decide that. But So, here's your habit. These are your habits. 
The goal is to remove these, in my opinion, and build that you build these and you remove these when they come up and then you build this into your habit of life. That's called transformation. So, verse 22, you take off the old system. You, a piece at a time. 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This renewal takes place by learning. We call it inhale and exhale. And that's what forms the character of Christ in you. That's how you build that. You get the pieces of God's Word and you put them in your soul and the Holy Spirit takes all these biblical pieces and concepts and builds the new man into your heart. Now you still have old man thinking that, that conflicts and tempts. Technically, you can stay over here in the new man and never leave. Never go back to that. You have the power to do that. But you don't. You don't do that. The old system has a lot of power too. It is, it has a draw. Because some of it felt really good. So, but we inhale and exhale. This is verse 23. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is the attitude that comes out of you from what you think. And then verse 24. And put on the new man which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness from the truth. So, what am I doing? I'm doing this. So, let's, see, let's do it this way. So you got this need, desire system. Over here is the old system that you built. Here is the new man system in Christ. And... This is who you're supposed to not be to systematically stop being, stop living this out, stop thinking this way, stop looking at it like that, and think about it this way, and live like this. Now, that's not too difficult to imagine. Over here, though, is a system of deception. The whole system is deception. We learn and believe the system and deceive ourselves. And then we create what's called, I call, the mask. So skip on over down to the principles on the back. Let's see if we can put some things together. The cosmic system promotes a man-centered source and solution. We, we, say, we think people are the primary solution to our hunger. We deceive ourselves by believing that the love and approval of people can fill our hearts. We believe when we're growing up and as we develop that people are the answer. And that getting people to like us, to love us, to approve of us, to want us, to enjoy us, I know this is just natural stuff that we go through. We develop strategies for getting people to do that. Now, some of us are like the boy that the guy said, I had to tie a pork chop around my neck for the dog to play with me. You know, that's how pitiful I was and how unfortunate I was. I didn't know that that was kind of me. I didn't know how to talk to people. When I was a kid, I didn't talk. So, therefore, <laughs> it wasn't until they figured out I could play sports well that people even paid any attention to me. I just kind of went under the radar. But one day, I running around on the playground, and I figured out I could outrun everybody. And they all were like, wow, you're great. And I thought, I'm great. I'm great. And so... I became the athlete. That was my claim to fame. I became the athlete. I had another talent, which was to listen. I was always a good listener. I would listen to people, and people felt cared about. So all these people would come and give me their problems. This was in way back in junior high. Now I've got a daughter like that, Tina. 
She, yeah, she can't get away from it. And, uh, but anyway, so that was another thing that I saw. Well, I'm pretty good at that. People seem to like me for that. So here's my, what I call the real self. Is that self? It's really the soul. Your soul is the one that has the need and desire. That's your soul. But listen, my soul, your soul was not acceptable to people, especially when you're young, especially to kids, other kids. So you have to put on a mask. There's two ways that you get socialized. One is like manners, right? No, you can't be selfish and you have to share and you have to sit in your seat and you have to be quiet and those just just manners. Nothing wrong with that. that. But look, your soul adopts manners. Why? Because you're in love with the Lord? No. So that you don't get spanked. Or you can get along. Your soul also adopts what I call strategies. And there are really roles people play. Tina was telling me about a friend who's oh so funny. He's just the funniest guy. He just cracks everybody up. Come to find out he's deeply depressed. It's the mask. He lives behind the mask. What's your mask? Listen, we all develop a mask. It's the, and the mask is designed, it's based on what we think other people will find appealing. You know, I figured if somebody watched the video, this would look better than my pajamas. Now, my soul, not my real self, I don't really care. But, you know, this is acceptable. It's appealing. <laughs> it's as appealing as I can get, but anyway. So, if you look at your page, there's the cosmic lie that love and approval from, pe from people will make us happy. How do you get happy? You get people to love you. So we tell ourselves this. I need people's approval. I can't live without people liking me and loving me. I mean, you've seen those kids in high school, in junior high and high school that nobody cared about, that nobody liked, that were just so <clears throat> inept that they couldn't function and everybody made fun of them and, and you don't want to be that guy, do you? So, buddy, you learn how to present yourself. You create a mask. You deceive others by hiding your flaws and weaknesses and increasing whatever you think is appealing. So we avoid our flaws and weaknesses. We mimic what works for others. We construct a mask of desired and acceptable language, ideas and behaviors to fit what the world calls beautiful, desirable. We, we build this mask that we live behind. It's called the psychology calls it the false self. It's the development of a socially required, i.e. manners, or socially desired, what's popular, persona, from behind which we conduct our behaviors and interact with loved ones and other believers. This is the mask. Some call it the public self. We present only our mask. We identify others. We identify ourselves as the mask. Listen, what happens is over time, you think you are the mask. And the real deep, inner, needy child inside of you gets squashed and suppressed and forgotten. And so you live out the mask. You live out the mask. You are the mask. But listen to me. You are not the mask. And God does not interact with your mask. He doesn't want your mask. I used to go to the, in my prayers, I'd go to God and I'd stand up straight and I would salute and I would 
confess my sins without emotion and thank, you know, thank God for everything, then I would always pray for others first. Then I'd pray for myself. And it was just following a formula. He's like, what are you doing? What are you doing, son? Come here. It wasn't until God got really mad with God. Have you ever been mad with God? <laughs> and I, I didn't know what to do about that. So finally, I just said, I just went into heaven. I saw myself go up and stand in front of him, and I just threatened him. He got scared, really scared. <laughs> but let, listen, listen. When I first, when I began to listen to myself and listen and, and begin to look for this mask and listen to what I was telling myself, I began to hear the Lord. And the Lord said to me, come here, son. He said, I know you've been mad at me for two years over that, what, that stupid thing right there. That would have been the worst thing ever for you. You'd have never preached a sermon for me. You'd have never done anything worthwhile. You'd have spent all your time trying to fix that problem that you were so in love with. He said, now come here, let's work it out. It was the beginning of a whole new life for me of being real with God, of not giving God what I thought God wanted, but giving God me, real me. Now, this inside behind your mask is your soul. And you will, if you go, if you start listening to yourself, because what controls you is what you tell yourself. That's thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, that's called inner dialogue. Esau was holding a grudge, telling, he said in his heart, I'm going to kill Jacob. He said it in his heart. That's, that's thinking. Behind the mask is you, and behind the mask is you, your soul, and that soul is a child. A child. You heard of the inner child? It's a child inside of you. And I know, look, I know you're all adult, and you're all mature, and you've got all the doctrines, and you've got them all laid out, and you've got them all organized, and you got all the doctrine. Just don't make sure it's not a mask. Make sure it's not you doing Christianity. That makes sense. You doing it. So we put on our Christian. See, I, I, I had this, I had this human mask. Then I got saved, and I've developed a Christian mask. Got on doctrine and developed a really sophisticated Christian mask. Didn't know God. Knew about Him. Had no connection with Him. Had no relationship with Him. I would encourage you to look behind the mask. So the mask is the deception. It's how we deceive each other. And listen, speaking the truth in love to one another... One mask can't speak to another mask. I don't, want, I, I don't want your mask. I want to know you. You say, no, you don't want to know me. No, no. You, want to, you, really, you don't want to know what's really deep down in here. But I tell you who does, and that's the Lord. The Lord wants to know you down in there. How about you? Do you want to know you down in there? You go, no. You know how long I've been <laughs> You know how many people are willing to actually look at themselves, honestly? It's hard to do. This is a difficult deal. So, one more thing. I think this is important. This, this need part of you is just, to me, it's something you can identify with, need and desire. I think it comes out of your soul. This is the part of you that lives forever. One of the objections to what I've said is that this inner child, which is the soul, that is your soul. It's just not grown. See, that you're supposed to go find that inner child and grow him up in, in the Lord. See, this is who's, who's supposed to apply the doctrine. Not make a mask 
powered by human ability to do Christianity. This little soul needs to fall in love with the Lord. So, the objection was, but no, look, that's the selfish part of me. That's the petty and needy and selfish. And yeah, it is. It is. It's that. But that's the, they said, that's the sin nature. Now listen, the sin nature is in your body. It's in, the, it's in your brain, in the patterns and habits that you have installed in the neurons of your brain. That is the sin nature. This guy right here hooked up to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God grows up into an adult who doesn't pretend, who doesn't look to people, that doesn't need people as their priority. This person can walk with the Lord and, and, and be an open channel, can, can systematically free themselves from slavery to this old way. This is deception. It starts in the world. We take it into ourselves and we build a persona that we present to the world. And this is me. This is who I am. This is what I am. This is what I have to offer. Love me, please. Please find value in me. Please see me as someone worthwhile. And listen. Listen. Everything that we hunger for and that we're trying to find through our old way, every last drop of it was given to you the moment you trusted in Jesus Christ. You already have it. You were, you were, you were, you were grabbed up as an orphan and made royal family of God. You were put into the body of Christ. You were accepted and loved and nurtured and put, put together with all these other believers. And you're part of a family now. You're accepted in Christ. You don't need to do anything to have exactly. But look, the problem is we still think it's over here. I do. My daughter graduated from college yesterday. We went and had a big time. I'm thinking, hope she realizes all that mom and I did for her and, and appreciates us. And I'm like, why? The Lord's like, what are you talking about, son? I appreciate you. What if she doesn't? How about giving her some grace? How about... How about taking all that I've given to you and just sharing it with her without needing anything? But I'm like, golly, I still want. That's that old way. Okay. Father, hopefully, this is sensible. I hope it's it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a complex discussion. And uh, I just pray, Father, that you'll make sense of it in people's souls. And, and show them that there's life, there's reality, there's a life of reality that's so much sweeter than needing other people's approval. And so I love you, Father. I thank you for what you've taught me. Teach us what to do with our false logic when it pops up and it produces sinfulness or human good or we're disoriented to you and we're disoriented to how to conduct ourselves in relationships and it doesn't work and it doesn't edify and I go, what, where did that come from? Help us to see the logic that we're using that's not from you and, and to reject it and remove it. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.